Today, uh, we'll talk a bit about moving applications to the cloud, doing it safely, doing it efficiently. <clears throat> Almost every established and mature organization will have some legacy systems that are critical to their success. Good ones might have been serving us well for years and allowed us to concentrate on running our real business. Invariably though, these applications age and may, longer, may no longer work well in the modern world. They may start to lag behind comparable tools and with respect to features uh, and convenience. Even when a replacement is found, many organizations put off the move for as long as possible. It's often viewed as, as risky and expensive distraction to the core business. In the software world, sometimes we refer to this as a, accumulating technical debt. But we eventually reach a point where moving these applications become a necessity. They hold critical data about our customers, our products, or finances. They're required for the correct functioning of our organization. But they may have not been updated for a long time. Uh, maybe they were uh, custom written or, or have been heavily customized. And the times come to, to think about moving to a more modern, capable system, likely in the, in the cloud. Uh, and while moving, uh, maybe take the time to pick up some additional, uh, uh, additional business benefits, right? Nip better reporting or improved uh, data quality. The final straw for deciding that it's time to tackle uh, a move well, could be a variety of things. Uh, your, your legacy application or its infrastructure may no longer be maintained an old operating system or, or database version or something that's bound to a particular piece of hardware that um, is being retired. Uh, or sometimes the, the infrastructure uh, remains in place, but it's becoming just increasingly and prohibitively expensive to the point where it's requiring uh, extended support contracts or special arrangements with, some, uh, with one of the major vendors. Maybe you've already mon uh, modernized some other applications and this one is no longer working well with uh, the others and, the, and their new replacements. Moving applications can sometimes be like a chain of, of dominoes. Moving one application precipitates uh, moving a series of others. Mobile device support can be a driver for, for making the move. Application is fine, but your, but your team is looking for more convenient, more portable access, uh, things that the current application was not designed to support. Or your legacy application may not have kept up, right, with the times. Uh, can't provide features which have become increasingly common elsewhere and your users are starting to demand, starting to demand fast search maybe, recommendation engines, AI-inspired analytics. These are all increasingly common uh, features that our users are starting to expect from software tools. So it's, it's time to move, but why move to the cloud? Move of your legacy app does not necessarily mean moving to the cloud, but that's the, that's the overwhelming trend and, and for some pretty compelling reasons, right? On-premise infrastructure is expensive and that calculus needs to include uh, the cost of the hardware, the cost of the physical space, the cost of the people required to tend to all of that infrastructure and get expensive. Cloud infrastructure typically offers higher availability. It's less susceptible to things like network outages or power outages. Uh, security is typically better uh, in the cloud. On-premise security is hard uh, and it's, it's getting harder uh, uh, with the advent of, you know, mobile access. And, and then of course, most recently with, with the, the demand to support our work from home staff, all, uh, all place 
security demands on on our uh, on-prem infrastructure that are uh, maybe better handled in the cloud. And as 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 mentioned, uh, some of the other applications we need to interact with, they may already be in the cloud and we need to exchange data or otherwise interact with them. So there's a need uh, to move specifically to the cloud. All right. So we have a spectrum of choices with what to do with these legacy applications, right? Of course, we can do nothing. We've already discussed, uh, you know, the risks there. Um, we could retire the old application. Maybe the features are available in other programs and the application really, you know, doesn't need to be replaced uh, explicitly. Uh, those two are, you know, you know, least likely uh, and, and probably the least interesting for our webinar today. So we'll sort of dismiss those two on the left there and focus, you know, from the, from the center left, you know, on to the right um, on this spectrum of things to do with our, with our legacy apps. Um, lift and shift, right? Uh, simply move the application from your data center into the cloud as is using the cloud essentially as infrastructure as a service service. Um, we could repurchase, maybe replace a legacy system with some commercial system. Uh, if we have a, maybe it's a, a employee management system that we can replace with some commercial HR system. We could replace parts of the application, maybe just the data uh, just moving the data to the uh, cloud warehouse and leaving the other uh, parts of the application uh, alone. Or, you know, as an extreme in the far right here, we can refactor uh, the application, essentially go all in on modern architecture, uh, refactor the application to use and take advantage of cloud native services. All right. When we do that, uh, if when you think about refactoring, uh, or even replatforming, there's a there's you know one key concept um, that is important to to explicitly recognize, right? Related to the decision uh, of your architecture, the choices for your architecture, and specifically that's the idea of of refactoring uh, the application into multiple uh, individual independent services. Our on-prem. Or, or our older legacy applications are, are often monolithic, right? A small number of programs, maybe just one program responsible for the, for the entire uh, capability, the, you know, the user interface, the business logic, even the data store treated as a single, uh, a single entity or, or a macro service, right? Uh, traditional on-premise type of architecture. On the other extreme, far right, uh, modern cloud-based applications uh, are typically constructed by assembling a combination of, of, of microservices, individual, uh, very narrow uh, featured services provided by our cloud uh, vendor, file systems, databases, security vaults, uh, rule engines, search services, right? All of those things are offered as services and they can be stitched together and assembled uh, to essentially create uh, a, a componentized version of our application. And of course, there's middle ground uh, refactoring to us, uh, you know, moving from monolithic to just a small number of, of more robust services. Uh, but this move from left to right, um, uh, it does bring flexibility, some, some agility, uh, to our application and its, and its uh, operation, but also adds some complexity and uh, with that complexity adds uh, some risk, right? So let's try to, to try to characterize this or bring this uh, into maybe a little clearer focus with a practical example of moving some legacy application uh, to the cloud. And let's look at, at, at maybe three of the approaches. So if I go back to my spectrum here, let's look at um, a, taking a particular application. Uh, we're not going to do nothing with it. We're not going to retire it, but we could lift and shift it, uh, or we could repurchase it, or we could refactor it. So let's look at, 
you know, what those three approaches to uh, uh, a movement to the cloud for a particular app uh, might look like, right? And so here's the, here's the application, right? On-premise runs in our internal data center uh, that's shown there in the blue box in the center. It includes, you know, the application itself. And then the application uses, in this case, a, a Postgres database, a relational database. Uh, the, this particular application, its, its purpose in life is to, is to get uh, information from our uh, CRM system. Uh, any changes in our CRM system, uh, apply some, some business rules to those changes, and then send reports directly to interested parties. Right? So for example, maybe a customer purchases uh, a new product, and so that's, that's marked in the, in the CRM. We need, we need to immediately get that information back to our fulfillment team and back to our finance team, right? And so this, this application that we've got is responsible for that, that uh, integration, right? Getting, uh, detecting the changes in the CRM and immediately uh, reshaping those and sending notifications to uh, other back office uh, departments that need to act on those changes, uh, you know, as quickly as possible, right? So that's our, that's our in-house application and we, we, we want to move this application and we want to move it to the cloud, right? So uh, lift and shift would be one approach to this, right? Uh, we can simply uh, pick the application up and move it uh, quite uh, quickly into the cloud, literally just moving the application. We'll, we'll create, uh, we'll choose a cloud. Uh, this slide I've, I've chosen AWS. I create a virtual machine. I install a Postgres database and install the application software. And I've essentially just picked up my application and dropped it into, uh, you know, an almost and perhaps even identical environment uh, in the cloud, right? There are some advantages of this to be sure, right? You can decommission your internal data center, right? You'll likely have a more secure, more reliable physical infrastructure uh, in the cloud. You can take advantage of, of automated uh, backups. You can take advantage of, of patches to the, uh, to, the, to the VM infrastructure, underlying operating system, right? You also might be able to take advantage of, of uh, the clouds with respect to elastic pricing. Right? Maybe you can take this. Uh, maybe you can take the application down in off hours when it's not needed, uh, and and save some some cost there. But it is uh, still basically the same application with the same feature set, only now it's running in the cloud. So lift and shift, one approach to to moving the application. Or we can go to an extreme, right? And completely re-architect the application as a cloud native app, right? So here's that same application architected to maximize the use of cloud microservices, right? To implement the solution. Completely serverless here. There's nothing explicitly defined, no servers that are, are defined or configured or, or operating. It's all done, uh, transparently. The CRM, uh, in this case now, makes a, a webhook style API call. Anytime a record changes, that goes through the firewall, then through an API, a, an API gateway. The gateway uh, spins up on the fly a Lambda function that accepts the call from the, the, the new message from the, uh, from the CRM. Uh, allowing a, you know, a quick acknowledgement and quick response sort of handshake back through. Uh, messages, the, the, uh, the new events put on, a, an, a, in this case, an, an Amazon event queue, an SQS event queue. That's sort of the storage area or the landing zone for these new messages as they come in from the CRM. And separately, asynchronously, right, there's another solution that wakes up every once in a while to see if there's any events on that queue. Uh, spins up the, the business rules uh, in a dynamic process to, to, to uh, do the transformation and send out the, uh, the notifications or the reports to our finance uh, and fulfillment teams, right? Same application, same, same purpose in life, but you can see how little this resembles 
our sort of traditional monolithic on-premise architecture, right? As I said, nothing explicitly provisioned, right? Lambda function uh, uh, wakes up to handle the ingest, SQS queues uh, intermediately stage the data, a, a, a cloud compute engine handles all the details with provisioning and executing the logic. Uh, we need a database, but that's also provisioned completely transparently to us. We don't create it. It just spins up when, when it's needed. We don't have to be concerned at all with the state of any specific machine, right? We've essentially fully uh, embraced a, a cloud native architecture for our application. Right? So between these two, between just lifting and shifting uh, and then totally re-architecting, another approach uh, in the cloud would be to, to look for something that we can purchase uh, as a unit to replace our application, right? We'll actually buy something off the shelf to replace our old application. In our case, uh, there may be a cloud-based solution that can essentially do everything that our on-prem application did, right? I think of um, uh, providers, there's a provider called Zapier, there's a, pri a provider called Ift, I-F-T-T-T, -T -T. Uh, either of those might be candidates to simply replace uh, the application that we have and fulfill, you know, the it's you know necessarily what it did, detecting the changes in HubSpot, doing some simple transformation and sending what we need to send to our to our finance and and fulfillment teams, right? And that's a simple example, right? But for more complex applications, uh, you may be able to choose a more complex off-the-shelf cloud-based system, a, a CRM. Salesforce CRM, particularly popular replacement for, for all manner of legacy systems, many of which have nothing to do with customer relationship, relationship management. This, the Salesforce platform uh, can be used to uh, build and deploy apps uh, completely independent of, of, of the actual CRM function. Clearly much simpler uh, than the cloud native approach I just showed or even the lift and shift approach that, that I showed. Um, here, you, the, the details of the architecture, you know, microservices, Mac, uh, uh, mini services, it's all, it's all the responsibility of, of the service provider. Um, cost here might seem high. Uh, we're essentially paying a third party to take care of, of everything. But when comparing that cost, uh, to our other options, do need to, to do it fairly and recognize that many costs associated with uh, lift and shift or designing something native and then operating it, you know, those, those, those individual costs go away with an approach like this. The big, uh, the big trade-off with uh, this sort of re replacement, repurchase, replacement approach uh, is simple, right? We will have to adapt to uh, a different set of features. Right, it's, it's very unlikely that we'll find something that does exactly what our legacy system does, but maybe it's close enough uh, to warrant the, uh, the advantages that you're gonna get with having to uh, eliminate the worries associated with, with ownership, with management, with, with maintenance of, of any application that you might try to, to operate yourself uh, in the cloud. So, There'll be risks in any of these approaches to, uh, to moving our application to the cloud. We previewed a few of them already, like what I just mentioned, your potential sacrifice of, of certain features uh, that, that might not be available uh, during the process. Uh, what I've got assembled here on this slide, just a compact list uh, of the risks that you need to sort of uh, make a checklist of, be aware of, and then some of the actions that we can take uh, to mitigate uh, those risks. So let's just run through these six topics very quickly. Uh, security, right? Uh, always a problem whether your your uh, application is on premise or in the cloud, you, but <clears throat> you're, you need to really expect attacks uh, on any of your cloud-based applications. Now your cloud vendor, uh, it's going to offer security features and advertise them and, and promote them, right? VPNs and firewalls, uh, 
uh, but these all need to be configured uh, and configured with care, right? Use your cloud's uh, credential management system, right? To support complex and frequently changing passwords. Limit the permissions as uh, to who can get into your cloud as, uh, as much as possible to minimize the dangers of, of socially engineered attacks. So some things uh, to be uh, uh, risks to be aware of as you as you contemplate the move to uh, the cloud monitoring. I'm going to skip for a second. I'll come back to that one. Uh, that's actually I think probably the most interesting uh, testing. Different set of uh, failure modes in the cloud, particularly in cloud native applications, uh, those that use a large number of these microservices. Right. So you need to uh, develop tests and that allow you to understand and react to, uh, you know, loss of, of one of the supporting microservices and an events queue or a secrets vault might go offline, for instance, how is your application going to behave or how are you going to de detect that? You need to test those conditions uh, and make sure you know how to respond. Back up, you know, I feel like, you know, uh, elementary school teacher here, this is just basic hygiene. Um, we've been taught for years that regular backups are important. That's just as true in the in the in the cloud. Uh, good news in the cloud, though, is that it's usually much easier to do, right? Because there, all of the details about backups can be uh, deferred to a, a service, right? Often provided as an automated service by your by your cloud provider, and 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 the backups are are probably more robust than what you you were doing on prem. If you were doing your backups on prem, we'll assume you were. Um, but the cloud can do things like, uh, you know, keeping your backup stored in some physically separate environment, right? So you do have some additional security there. Uh, it does come out, uh, does uh, does come with a cost. Um, do you need to uh, make care you can configure a fairly robust backup system uh, and you'll end up being charged, you know, for all of that storage space and the movement of those backups, you know, between uh, availability zones, for example, right? So you do need to make sure uh, that while you can turn on a backup process in the cloud, that you uh, you, you, you take care of it uh, and you know figure out a good file rotation and retirement of of, uh, of uh, old or invalid backups to avoid you know unnecessary uh, unnecessary storage costs uh, in the cloud. Skills, uh, different set of skills needed. Uh, when you start operating your applications uh, in your in the cloud versus on-prem, and develop and likewise uh, developing them, uh, right? Uh, particularly true again if you choose to go with a cloud and build your own sort of cloud native application. The skills I'm talking about those they center around the ability to understand and choose uh, the cloud services that you're going to use in your. Uh, in the design of your sort of native cloud implementation of your application, right? It's natural that the, that you need that uh, that that would be a new skill, something that you didn't have, because um, you know you're using uh, a stitching together services that uh, would probably be quite difficult to implement on your own, an event queue or a or a, a, a secrets vault or a uh, an object store, right? So the good news is. You don't have to build those services. You don't have to build your own event queue or your own secret storage or, or recommendations engine. Uh, but you do need to invest in the expertise and how they work so that you can design your solution to use them appropriately. Remember uh, that use case that I showed uh, in, the, in its native cloud native used five separate cloud services. I mean, you know, you do need to come up to speed and choose those services correctly and configure them correctly. And that's a that's a skill set that's uh, uh, you'll need to develop. Uh, regionality is my, a minor thing, but uh, annoying, right? There are real physical limits to the cloud. Some of the services that you may want to use in your architecture may not be available in your particular, you know, cloud neighborhood or your cloud region. So you may design uh, and test an application in one region and then uh, decide you want to move it to another uh, from US East to, you know, US uh, Mountain or, or uh, Europe West, right? 
a specific type or uh, size of a virtual machine that you designed for may be available in US East, but not available in, in some other region, not available in, in, the, in the mountain region or in the, in the Europe West region, right? So just something uh, that you would never think about having to be uh, aware of that you do actually need to be aware of and it can catch you, catch you off guard if you want to uh, uh, distribute your application throughout uh, different availability zones uh, in the cloud. But let's bounce back to, uh, to monitoring the second, uh, second item, um, which is really probably the most common uh, risk area uh, cost monitoring, cost control. Increasingly, uh, this is a topic of concern with, with cloud applications. There's a, a cottage industry actually uh, growing uh, uh, surrounding products and services aimed at helping companies understand and control costs associated with moving applications uh, to the cloud and then operating them once they're there, right? Cloud is a la carte, right? I talked about those microservices. Well, all those microservices, they have price tags, right? Uh, each of the services has their own cost. You need to understand what those costs are uh, and how to control them. Um, and, and those costs will be variable, right? Based on the amount of the data volume that, that's running through your, your application, but also maybe on an occasional misconfiguration, right? Uh, if, if the system uh, develops a bug or there's some issue with you, even, even with the host CRM and you get you know, more events that, than you expect or repeated events, right? All of, you know, up, uh, operate on, operating on those uh, in some misconfiguration, there'll, there'll be, uh, you know, costs associated with that. And costs associated with development as well. Right, actually building this thing has a cost in the cloud. Uh, uh, you know, I just talked about skills and, and developing those, but even presuming your, your dev team has the skills, right? Uh, you really have to keep a, a, a close control over uh, the development process to prevent accidental or unnecessary provisioning of infrastructure, particularly oversized infrastructure, infrastructure you don't need, right? surprisingly easy to get up there in the cloud and provision a, a large or fast or otherwise expensive disk uh, and then forget to destroy it or to, to allocate a static IP address to something that is transient and, and doesn't need a static IP or to, you know, automatically and accidentally start backing up test databases that have no value. Uh, all of those are uh, examples of, of ways that you can really unexpectedly incur, incur costs uh, when you're operating in the cloud. Testing activities, classic source uh, for these types of, of cost overruns. Your test team might spin up uh, a copy of your, of your uh, proposed solution in some test environment uh, and set it up to do performance testing or set it up to do stress testing. Tests that take take days to run and use huge volumes of data uh, and, and are necessary, but, but maybe the required infrastructure might be, which is expensive because it's so big, is accidentally left on for days uh, or weeks beyond the point that uh, the tests were complete, right? Now there, your cloud vendor recognizes these things. They'll, they'll provide consumption reports, right? So that you can keep track of where your spend is. Um, also monitoring tools, right? I have a monitoring tool set up that, that tells me as soon as I hit a threshold in, in my cloud infrastructure uh, and reminds me, you know, that I left something on or, you know, asks me to, to uh, uh, causes me to think critically about uh, which services I have currently running uh, in case I've moved on to some other project or moved on to some other activity and, and left something running that I didn't need to, to have uh, operating. But you do need to consider uh, to, to sort of minimize this risk, having identifying someone in your organization as the service owner, right? Someone who can monitor the reports uh, that get sent by your provider, someone that can set the thresholds and keep track of those and actively uh, monitor and understand your service consumption uh, and prevent uh, uh, some unexpected and, and very uh, potentially painful uh, surprises on the cost side. Right. So we've talked 
about moving applications to the cloud, the reasons why, the choices you have along the way, the risks that uh, you need to keep in mind uh, as you choose your path. It's complicated and for mission crit critical applications, it's uh, an initiative that you really need to approach carefully. So our final, final piece of advice here uh, is to consider engaging some help. Uh, there are consultancies that can help you with, with, this, uh, with this kind of move. Um, if you choose to repurchase your application, you know, find a partner uh, with specific expertise in the platform you're targeting, whether it's Zapier or, or maybe you're going to use uh, Salesforce and try to implement there. Uh, if you choose instead an approach that, that uh, is cloud native and you want to design your own application, find a partner with expertise uh, in, in your chosen cloud and then also expertise generally in migrating these kinds of apps. Um, as it happens, uh, uh, CloverDX uh, offers some of these uh, services and products, right? Uh, we offer a platform piece of software. Uh, the CloverDX data management platform helps, uh, uh, is a tool designed uh, to help move your applications. And then we have a, a consulting team uh, that has experience helping clients move uh, their applications. Right, some of our specific competencies, right? Um, we can help you move bespoke applications uh, that were provided by uh, a vendor that uh, some other third party vendor who you uh, who may no longer be available uh, or cooperative or other, otherwise accessible, right? So you've got some lost, uh, lost knowledge that needs to be recovered. Uh, we can work with uh, some very complex legacy applications, even those that have been around for years and customized many times over, right? Uh, this move is an excellent opportunity to clean up uh, messy data, to remove cruft. Uh, we have separate webinars all about <laughs> removing uh, messy data, uh, right? Uh, that's something that, uh, that we have a strength. We can help you uh, slim down your data and move only the data that still matters to your organization. That's, you know, almost separate or independent of moving the application uh, itself. And we can help uh, under deadline pressure, right? We're pretty nimble. Uh, and you know, a lot of times you'll end up uh, with a surprise when you're you realize that your legacy system is is uh, is at some end of support timeline that is fixed fixed point in time, and and all of a sudden you've got a, a, a serious deadline where you've got no choice but to to move the application. Right. Our data management platform, uh, the tool that we bring to this process, uh, uh, very uh, effective at uh, making the process of moving efficient. It's a low code environment, uses visual design uh, and configurable and reusable components so we can quickly design uh, pipelines or solutions for moving your application uh, and its data. And we'll consider, you know, the entire problem, right? Not just, you know, the bits that are most obvious or the bits that are easy, right? Um, selecting which data to move, cleansing and reshaping that data validating at the end that the, the new application is behaving uh, exactly like the old application was uh, or exactly how you expect it, making sure that the data that you expected to make the move made the move and made it correctly and everything is, is operating uh, successfully, right? So we've got good, uh, good experience and good tool sets for that. Um, and with that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll conclude and, and say good luck, right? On any application move, move moves that you uh, are planning to make. Uh, happy uh, to take any questions right now, but also uh, we welcome the opportunity to talk to you individually about <clears throat> any of your application uh, move plans. Uh, thanks, and, and I'll, I'll throw it back to Kate. Thanks, Kevin. I hope everybody found that interesting. Um, if you do have any questions, then uh, just pop them in the Q&A box and I'll throw those over to Kevin so he can uh, address them once he's had a chance to catch his breath. Um, we've actually had a few sort of comments and questions in as you were going through that, Kevin. Um, I'll just uh, throw a couple of them over. I think these ones are sort of comments rather than questions. We had a couple of people um, talking about how they've seen companies starting with a sort of lift and shift approach, followed by some sort of replatforming before kind of getting all the way to, to refactoring. Is that something that uh, yeah, that's a that's a that's an effective strategy. It gets you uh, it gets you comfortable with the cloud. It gets you off your on prem. We see that mostly when we like got to get off prem now, right? And so, well, okay, well, let's go this way, uh, and and we'll get off prem and we'll we'll solve that problem. And 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 then once we're in the cloud safely, 
uh, we can sort of uh, regroup and reassess and maybe uh, it, it can be an iterative approach, right? Uh, that slide I showed about, uh, you know, macro services to microservices, that can be a journey. You can start replacing, you know, replacing parts of the plane in flight, so to speak, uh, removing bits that are monolithic with individual services. So yeah, it, it can be a, uh, that's, a that's an actually fairly uh, astute observation. Uh, sounds like it's born in experience, but yeah, it's, it, it, uh, it is a, it's a good, it's a good way to go. Just uh, to talk about your risks uh, point, Jeff actually pointed out that um, often with sort of regulatory concerns, uh, you can, it can be important to know where your cloud provider is physically storing uh, backups and uh, what their ability is to destroy content on demand. Yep. Uh, yes, the, the, the whole regionality uh, that, I, that I mentioned, that's a strength of the cloud, but it's also something uh, that you have to be specifically aware of. Uh, and uh, most cloud vendors will will uh, you know guarantee that your your uh, your application is running in a specific uh, geographic zone, and the data will not leave that zone unless you you know specific unless you make arrangements for that. Right? We have clients, uh, particularly with GDPR, uh, that have that actually need to have multiple copies of their application in the cloud uh, for that very reason. You know, uh, we have a, we have a client who has uh, three data centers in Europe, one in Europe, one in Australia, and one in the US. Uh, same application in, in three, but they're, they're completely isolated from each other, uh, specifically to handle that, those uh, data security uh, requirements. Well, we've actually had a question in uh, from somebody who's asking, uh, if they move to the cloud, they'd like to remain as independent from a specific cloud provider as possible. How do they ensure this? Uh, there, that's a, another, it's a good question. It's a classic uh, engineering trade-off, right? Lift and shift, as I, as I suggested, is probably the safest way to, uh, to stay cloud independent, uh, but at a cost of not necessarily using your cloud, your particular cloud provider's um, set of microservices, right? Uh, using, for, for example, a security, uh, our, our favorite is uh, secrets management, right? A place to keep secure passwords or uh, uh, to encrypt certain data. Uh, each cloud uh, may provide different services for those, right? And so uh, it can be a challenge to, uh, to design something that can easily, that both takes advantage of a cloud's uh, individual services but also is transportable across clouds. That's a that's a classic engineering trade-off that um, you have to think about. Okay, we have another question in from Gordon, who is asking uh, whether there are any cases that show the full financial implications of moving legacy applications to the cloud. It says the business owner of the application likely sees little additional business benefit that enhances the original legacy business case. So the majority of the financial benefits would accrue to the service delivery or operations department only. Uh, yeah, and, and, and maybe that's, that's by design. Uh, you know, you want to provide, you're, you're providing a service to your end users and, and it, you know, in some respects, it should be transparent to them. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't have any uh, reference material that I can show you, uh, but I, I would be, uh, I would imagine there's some some fairly uh, robust and deep case studies out there uh, somewhere, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't don't have any specific uh, uh, references I can point you to. One of our other attendees, Mark, has actually just uh, responded to that and said um, the business can uh, maybe benefit from quicker turnaround on system enhancements for in-house developed systems. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for that, uh, Mark. Um, let me just see what other questions. And if anybody on if anybody on the call knows of an interesting case study, uh, pop it into the chat. Right, uh, uh, we're a group here, all interested in the same problem. So if you come across an interesting article that that discussed, uh, uh, you know, was a, an actual business case that sort of uh, itemized all of those costs, um, uh, that'd be great to share with uh, the rest of the audience. We'd love to see it as well. Yeah, and just say, if you are going to post uh, interesting comments in the chat, um, make sure you send them to everybody if you want everyone to kind of uh, see and contribute to this because there's some sort of interesting conversations going on. 
Um, so Deepak has asked a question about testing and said, please elaborate on the testing aspect while migrating legacy applications, as most of the legacy apps are missing testing and forget about automation testing. Right. Uh, it is an opportunity when you when you move uh, to try to clean up your um, you know that aspect of the, the life cycle of your application. If you don't have existing test harnesses, uh, that those can be hard. It can be hard to um, uh, you know do comparisons. You know, so it's always nice to have a baseline to test once you get your application in the cloud to run it and compare the results with the same, you know, the same application that's running uh, on prem. Um, but if you, if you don't have that, uh, then, uh, you know, that could, they're definitely a challenge there. I'm not sure I have anything particularly uh, uh, helpful to offer there other than, you know, recognizing that's a, uh, that's a, that's a definite piece of the, of uh of the move of the journey that you're making. Uh, and it's, you know, often an, an example of an un, unexpected cost, right? It's like, well, we've got this up here and we need to test it. And, and now we're realizing that, well, we really didn't have any tests for the old system. So we can't reuse those. We're going to have to, to, to create, uh, uh, create a new set of tests uh, to make sure that we're, we're operating correctly. Right. There are things our platform can do really behind the scenes uh, that can that can do, t you know, automated tests on on data stores, for example. Right. To make sure that a data store is is, is uh, maintaining integrity after uh, a certain set of uh, application events have occurred. Right. So we can run you can design tests in the cloud that say capture the data store, capture the state of my uh, my data set, run a series of operations, and then capture the state again uh, and uh, evaluate to make sure that only the only expected differences are there. So there's there are, there are testing strategies, um, but um, yeah, uh, it often exposes this kind of movement. Off, often exposes you know some of the the. the the technical debt I think I mentioned at the beginning that you that uh, maybe your organization has been living with for a while uh, by not you know having tests for uh, legacy applications. Good stuff. Okay, we've got a questions coming from Grant, who's asking, what are the biggest security concerns you recommend to folks uh, for folks to watch out for between the different solution options? Well, the, the biggest, uh, I guess, thing to understand is, you know, <clears throat> is your cloud provider is going to provide uh, a whole series of, of security. I mean, their, their whole business depends on them providing a secure uh, uh, platform, but also a flexible platform, right? So uh, a rich set of security capabilities are going to come uh, and or be waiting for you uh, when you arrive in the cloud. But configuring those is uh, can be incredibly complex, right? So if you're if you're when you're doing something on your own with a lift and shift, or with designing something cloud native, um, you do have to understand, you know, how your virtual virtual private cloud is configured, what the network. Uh, configuration is, what the uh, individual roles uh, of users that can sign into your space are. There's uh, a whole certification. Most, most of the cloud vendors provide individual certifications just on understanding and, and configuring the security uh, parameters that surround your cloud application. It's very very powerful, uh, but with that comes uh, some, some uh, equally uh, equal equally powerful complexity, I'll say, right? Which is one of the, one of the, uh, another advantages, right, of, of deferring to someone, uh, particularly if this is your first, first go uh, to, to uh, looking at uh, an outside consultancy, someone who's, who's, you know, primary job in life is to, is to uh, build these application environments and, and set up the security, right? Powerful, but complex. No easy answers there, mate. 
<clears throat> okay, next question. Um, while approaching a lift and shift model, is there any approach in case of any rollback plans? Uh, well, any migration should have uh, a rollback plan. It's going to be pretty straightforward, I think, with uh, uh, lift and shift because you've got an essentially have an identical copy of your of your application, right? So uh, you leave the old application running uh, as long as you can, uh, or make it available. You know, if possible, make it available. Make the on-prem version uh, available to you. When you lift and shift, you can lift and shift multiple instances as well, right? That's another nice thing about the cloud, right? You can put up two or three of them, uh, you know, simultaneously in separate clouds uh, and then experiment with uh, different configuration options. And if, if one of them fails, um, you know, have, be able to, to switch over to the other one. These are just, I'm actually honestly just whiteboarding ideas with you now, guys. These are all really interesting uh, questions. Okay, well, I have another one for you. Uh, this is quite a long one, so um, bear with me, and I hope I get it right, Gordon. So, um, do you have a capability maturity methodology that assesses the approach to moving to migration that is part of a company's strategic IT plan? Service slash vendor management undergoes a major shift, as do consultative services, which many companies would need to acquire and their skills experience competitive environment. How do the cloud providers scale themselves to keep ahead of the skill demand curve? Uh, well, are they? I guess is probably the, the, the most interesting question that I would you know, come back with. It, you're describing uh, some fairly formal science uh, about trying to control uh, and to create uh, auditable and you know, mature processes, right? The CMM model is, uh, is uh, even without respect to the cloud, uh, there are, there are uh, surprisingly few organizations that, you know, have adopted that, uh, the, the, that CMM model effectively on prem, right? It certainly doesn't get any easier uh, in the cloud. So, uh, in fact, it, it, I think it probably just makes your question that more, much more relevant. Um, because the cloud, you know, because of the risks that are there, right? Uh, and I'm not sure. I, I can't. I, I'm. I'm not a. Uh, a uh, I can't claim to be uh, an expert on on the CMM model. Uh, and I, I don't know uh, if there are uh, cloud specific variants or um, iterations over the CMM uh, that specifically address cloud. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I just want to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to talk about the uh, upcoming webinar that you should be seeing on your screen right now. So next week, our webinar is about uh, data ingestion versus data integration. Uh, what's the difference between the two? So I'm just going to put that link in the chat there. Um, if anybody wants to come along to that, we'd love to see you. Um, so if you go to that page, you can sign up to register for next week's webinar. I think that's about all the questions we've had in for now. Um, Oh, actually, one last question in from Deepak says, uh, do you suggest any particular books or articles or any other resources to help about migration? Um, I don't have a favorite. It's a rich space. Uh, I, I don't think you'll have any, uh, any trouble. And again, that question goes to the audience, right? If anybody's got a favorite book or, or they found something that's interesting. Um, a lot of times the resources start, uh, a, a good place to start is with the cloud that you've selected. I didn't go into cloud selection. Uh, most of the time, I just presume that's a that that decision had always, has already been made. Um, but uh, if you're Azure specific, you know, starting in the Azure ecosystem usually is a, is a good place to start. A good place to uh, begin that search for for interesting uh, how tos or articles. Okay, great. I think then if uh, nobody else has any other questions, uh, we will wrap it up for today. So thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, thank you all of you who's, uh, who've attended. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. And we hope to see you on one of our other webinars soon. Thanks yep, very much. Thanks, guys. thanks very much.